so I just start singing in the shower. I don't know when you get your song, but I tell you, we've got so much to praise the Lord for, don't we? That we just can't stop from singing His praise. What a joy it is to be able to know we can have Christ in our hearts and encourage others along the way. It's a thrill to be here at First Baptist Church. We're looking forward to a great day today, and uh, we're looking forward to do a gospel concert tonight as well as share the gospel in preaching as well. So if you've got some friends, relatives, even enemies, invite them uh, to come tonight at six o'clock. And uh, good news as well, our son and daughter-in-law, Naya and Alicia, some of you follow them on Facebook and their concert ministry, they'll be joining us tonight. So that'll be an extra special treat. And we're just thankful to be able to serve the Lord. Thank you for your prayers during uh, the challenging times that we've faced over these last several months with my wife's cancer surgery and her uh, continued recovery. Thank you so much for your kindness and for your gifts. That's a blessing. But we know that we're not going to live here forever, don't we? And we know that uh, we're going to have the opportunity to be able to honor and serve the Lord someday forever in glory. And I say someday because that's really what it's all about. One day.
Okay. I love it. I love it. Well, I just want to mention to you, if you are interested in seeing the Bible come to life, pick up a brochure out at the table about our trip to Israel. It's going to be an exciting adventure as we walk through the land that Jesus walked in and uh, see the places where so many of our Bible uh, heroes uh, lived and walked, and it's absolutely amazing to be on the Sea of Galilee and to realize that Jesus was on that sea, that he calmed the storm, and then to stand at Mount Carmel and see where Elijah had that awesome uh, showdown with the prophets of Baal, and to uh, walk through Jerusalem and to see where Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign someday in the center of the earth, Jerusalem. The city of the great king. It's an amazing thing. Our, uh, our trip for this fall is, uh, or this, uh, this winter is actually filled up, but in 2020, we'll be going again. And if you're interested, think about this, November 30th through December the 9th. And I just want to mention that because it'll change the way you think about your Bible and it may be an encouragement to you, something you maybe you've been planning or thinking about for a long time and we would love to have you join us. We'll have a native guide who will share with us the political and geographical things that are going on, and then I'll be sharing the scripture of what happened in the Bible and how it relates to our lives. It's like a revival on wheels. 
and uh, this will be a 10-day tour, and you might be interested in that. Pick up a brochure. It'll give you the information and, and uh, hopefully encourage you along the route. Uh, as uh, you think about today, let's be asking God to do the work. I- I'm really praying about this, that God is going to, is going to answer the prayers of our people here. And they're going to see God move in a very special way as he brings the right man here to pastor this church. That's what we're asking God for is the right man uh, at the right time. And this is the place, isn't it? And uh, God bless you as a family of God for hanging together and sticking together and loving on each other and helping each other. That's what it's all about, the family of God. But we've got a kingdom purpose, don't we? And we've got to move on and move forward. And we pray that that'll be the case here at First Baptist. And uh, we just look forward to seeing what God's going to do. You know, it's amazing as we go through life, the challenges that we face and I'm enamored with the people that we meet who struggle. I went into a nursing home in Pennsylvania and I saw a lady that was sitting there in the corner. We were inviting people to come to the service that we were having. And there was a lady back in the corner. So I went into a room and I said, ma'am, would you like to come to our service today? We're gonna to sing some great songs of the faith and we're gonna talk about Jesus. We're gonna open the Bible. And she said, no, I don't think so. And I said, well, I'd love to take you if you'd like us to. Uh, we, we can put you in your chair right here. Will you write down there? No, she says, nobody cares about me. I said, really, tell me about your family. She says, I don't have any family. She says, I don't have any kids. My husband's dead. She says, I have nothing to look forward to. Nobody cares about me. So I stopped what I was doing, which was trying to invite people to come to a service. And I stood there next to that lady, and I said, Well, ma'am, I'll tell you something. I know somebody who does care about you. His name is Jesus. And he understands exactly what you're going through. And as I shared with her the scripture, I was enamored again that God meets any of us. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, no matter what trial you have, Jesus understands. He knows what you're facing. And so we're asking God, to help us. And as a result, I, uh, I thought about that. A man wrote me a note from Michigan, and he said, Randy, he said, I got some lyrics for a song I'd like you to write. He said, okay. And I read the lyrics. I get a lot of requests like that. A lot of people are not poets. Some people don't know anything about music, but they got an idea. And up at the top, it said, Jesus understands. And I said, that's what I'm thinking. And so I tried to take the words that he had and put them together and, and think about how important it was that we get that message to other people. And so I wrote this song, but I've asked my son who came from Virginia to sing it. I said, think about it. Jesus understands. He knows all about us. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, Jesus understands your greatest. silence all alone, faced with pain and hurt and fear of the unknown. I cried out in faith to God who hears my plea, and the darkness fades and sorrows quickly flee. I know Jesus understands. Jesus understands and interests. 
show up as uh, you can tell as a young man uh, he sang with us a lot and boy we sure appreciate you coming son that was beautiful to honor his grandpa and to make sure he got some of grandma's strawberry frozen jelly yeah, that's some good stuff right there. And to see, of course, his Aunt Cindy and Aunt Tammy and Uncle Jimmy and his cousin Heather and Scott and, and uh, all of them together. And Aunt Tammy is my pastor's wife, and I'm so thankful for the blessing of being able to be a part of that ministry as well. It is a thrill. Would you take your Bibles this morning and go to the book of Romans? Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10. Yesterday I was, uh, uh, Friday, I was driving toward town to uh, get to the post office. Boy, I like, I like this town. You can get things done in a short amount of time. Get done, move on to the next thing. And uh, so I went to the post office and I met the lady there and I was talking with her. And then I went and got some things at the Dollar General. Boy, that's a big store right here in New London. And uh, I love that as well. And, uh, and headed down to uh, Miller's. And I was, I, as I was headed up 60 here, uh, all of a sudden I saw the emergency medical team coming. The lights are flashing and, and everything's going on. And I thought, man, I got to get over and there's plenty of room on this road to get over, which I was glad about. And they came, I had no idea what it was. There's a good possibility it might have been the, that. I, what day did that accident happen? Tuesday it wasn't, so it wasn't that, but it must have been something else. But anyway, somebody needing rescue. Somebody needing to have someone help them. And uh, whenever that happens and we pull over, I always pray, Lord, would you please help whoever needs help? Would you please lead them to somebody that can encourage them and help them? Because we never know when we're going to need help. We never know when we're going to need a rescue. I see my daughter and I am reminded as when she was just a young girl, we took a trip to Arizona from Oregon where we were living at the time. And, and we went down there for a wedding that my wife and I were going to be involved in, one of her roommates in college. And as we traveled down there, we stopped in Arizona. It's as hot in the nighttime as it is in the daytime. And, and we stopped and pulled over at a motel on the way down. And evidently, the California Angels farm team was there because they had occupied all the rooms except one or two. And the clerk said, I think we can get you a room once they get settled. So they were all in there, all these big ball players, and they were doing their thing. And we got in there, and I said, man, it's so hot. It's like 105 degrees at night. And of course, it's kind of a dry heat, different than here in Ohio. And, and I said, hey, look, there's a swimming pool. Nobody's in it. Well, why would they be? It's 10 o'clock at night. But that's when we got in. And I said, boy, it'd be a great time to let the kids take a little dip in the pool. And so we really quickly moved into our room and then changed. And, and our kids were just small. And we had, we had just three of them at the time. And it was, it, it was, you know, it was a different world back then with three instead of six. Um, and our oldest one, he's ready. And, and I noticed when we walked over by the pool, I'm holding Miranda's hand. She's just two years old and, and she's just a little girl. And, and I noticed as we're going by the pool and I thought somebody's been here before. There was like a pool noodle in there and there was a ball in the pool. And, and so we went over and we were getting ourselves prepared and taking our flip flops off and all of that sort of thing. And I looked around and I said, where's Miranda? And I saw ripples in the, in the pool. And I thought, what in the world? And I looked at her, it looked like she, she was in the pool. And the ball was right there next to the edge of the pool. And evidently, she had walked right over there next to that ball and tried to reach over and fell in. And I didn't even hear her. It happened so quietly. And I said, honey, is that, is that? I didn't even have my, I still had my clothes on. I jumped right into the water. And, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm jumping and I'm reaching for her. I came up, where is she? over there and I, I swam over there and grabbed a hold of her pulled her up and she's sputtering and, and spitting water out and, and we took her we never went swimming that night we just sat there by the pool and hugged our daughter and said thank you Lord 
You just never know what's going to happen. And you never know when you're going to need a rescue, when you're going to need to be saved. I, I couldn't help but think of that as uh, I, was, uh, I was thinking about it. All, all the people need rescued. And, and my mother-in-law, she said that over there by her place, they, they brought a helicopter in. And I thought, man, usually they're for rescue. What happened? She said, no, they brought a chain down and they had a saw and they were cutting the trees off next to the woods there. I said, what in the world? That's crazy. <laughs> but if you see a helicopter with a long chain, usually there's somebody trying to rescue somebody, isn't there? Somebody's got to get out. They've got to be life flighted. They've got to go somewhere. Somebody needs saved. Look what he says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. You say, oh, preacher, I, I know that verse. <laughs> yeah, but that's why it's there. Would you read it with me, please? Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's read it again. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want you to notice a few things about this simple verse today. Would you notice, first of all, the reach of this verse? He says, whosoever. Whosoever. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you're from. I don't know what all the details are about your life. But I know this. That the saving, rescuing arm of God reaches down to whosoever you are. Whosoever. It doesn't matter who you are. God doesn't have any respect of persons. But he comes to you. Remember in John chapter 3 and verse number 16, it says, For God so loved the world. Or you could put your name in there. You're part of this cosmos, aren't you? That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John chapter 4 and verse number 13, Jesus said, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give shall never thirst. Whosoever. You're a whosoever. And the reach of God comes to you tonight. And it's amazing to me that John told Martha, or Jesus told Martha in John chapter 11, he says, And yet ye shall believe, and whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall never die. Whosoever. You're a whosoever. Think of it. The whosoever reaching arm of God reached down to a religious man in John chapter number 3. Do you remember him? His name was Nicodemus. In John chapter 4, the whosoever reaching arm to the whosoever in John chapter 4 reached down to a woman who had five husbands and she was living with another one. The woman at the well. In John chapter 8, the long reaching arm of God reached down to a whosoever that was a prostitute and she was caught in the very act of her sin and adultery and reached down to her. In John chapter 9, you may remember that there was a blind man and the ever reaching arm of God reached down to a blind man with a physical infirmity and changed his life. You may remember that in Acts chapter 9, there was a terrorist and a murderer by the name of Saul. Later turned to Paul because God's long-reaching arm came down to a whosoever named Saul and changed him in a moment on the road to Damascus. You may remember that not only a terrorist, but a military man in chapter number 10 of Acts, that was Cornelius. You say, I know some military men. God can reach military men. And it reaches to him. And the Bible continues to tell us in Acts chapter number, chapter number 16, it says that God reached down and he impacted a woman by the name of Lydia. She was a businesswoman. You say, now you're getting me. Yeah, the reaching arm of God reaches the military, it reaches the down and out, it reaches the prostitutes, it reaches those who are in sin, those who think they're great, those who are religious, all of those things it reaches everywhere. You'll actually remember in, in Acts chapter 18 that it reached down to a boy who had a mama who was a Jew and a daddy who was a Greek. And somehow that mixed marriage 
You say, wait a minute. Are you telling me that God reaches me? Oh, whosoever you are. The reach of God comes to you today. No matter what your status is, no matter where you work, no matter what degrees you have, no matter what your financial portfolio looks like. Why? Because none of us are born saved. None of us are born saved. All of us are sinners. Listen to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse number 20. He says, for there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. There isn't one. How about 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and verse number 36? It says, there is no man which sinneth not. You say, I knew that from Romans chapter 5. Look what it says there. Turn back a couple pages and verse number 12. It says, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. Would you read the rest of the verse with me, please? And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Look at chapter number three and verse number 10. Romans three and verse number 10. As it is written, there is none righteous no not one for all verse 23 have sinned and come short of the glory of god we're all sinners we all need help galatians chapter 3 and verse number 22 the scripture hath concluded all under sin we're all a mess but the grace of god and the far-reaching arm of god reaches to whosoever you are you can count on that. But notice there's a request. In Romans chapter 10 and verse number 13, it says, whosoever shall call, shall call. Now, I don't know about you, but in this day and age, it's a whole lot simpler now to grab your cell phone out of your pocket and make a phone call, isn't it? You remember the old days when we used to have to find a pay phone? For years, we tried to find a payphone. Where's a payphone? Where's a payphone? So we can call dad and mom and let them know where we are. And then when you got the payphone, then there for a while, they had those, uh, those cards that you could get that had a hundred numbers you had to punch in. Remember that? And uh, it was in in interesting. The kids nowadays, I mean, you can't even have a Superman show without a payphone booth. You know what I'm talking about? Kids don't even understand. Used to be into the nearest phone booth. There he comes, right? What's that? <laughs> a phone booth. We saw one in Mansfield, Pennsylvania. <laughs> An old phone booth. There's no phone there now, but the booth's still there. <laughs> and I said to my son, I said, come here, son. I want you to see this. This is great. You go in there, and then you dial those numbers. You remember our fingers used to get sore from mm -hmm. And then when they came in with touch tone, I mean, that was like something fancy. Wow, it was like new technology. Of course, it replaced the old party lines. Remember that? <laughs> I know you had them up here. What was the name of that lady that used to get out of your house? <laughs> you could always tell when she was on. You'd hear that click. Then you hear that breathing. <laughs> and you knew your number, didn't you? It was two longs or two shorts or whatever it was, whatever your beep was, your signal. Uh, hey, listen, he says that whosoever you are, all you have to do is call. Nowadays, we have a problem, though. Once you do get a call, I was called, talking to my son yesterday, and all of a sudden, call failed. You don't have to worry about that with God. All you have to do is call. You've got to make a request. <laughs> that was interesting. And <laughs> one sign, one sign, it, it was a sign for, for plumbing. And it said, plumber, and here's what the sign said. It says, we repair what your husband fixed. <laughs> you say, what? and then there's a phone number there. All you got to do is call. We repair what your husband fixed. That's not nice, is it, guys? Man, we do our best, don't we? 
<laughs> Sometimes we should call more often. Uh, but he says, whosoever shall call. And you're going to notice it shall call upon. There's a declaration. It has to be declared. And, and Psalm chapter 91 and verse 15, it says, he shall call me and I will answer. <laughs> In Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3, he says, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Hey, when you call upon the Lord, it's going to be different. Zechariah chapter 13 and verse number 9, it says, They shall call upon me and I will hear them. God hears this prayer from any whosoever who dares to call. But you're going to have to do it. Not only is it declared, but it's directed. Notice it says, call upon the name of the Lord. You can't just call anywhere. You can't just call the hardware store uptown. You, you can't just call the grocery store. You just can't call your friend. You're going to have to call on the name of the Lord. Oh, my. When you get involved in the name of the Lord, I tell you what, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. And you and I have the opportunity to make a request and to call. And we're going to need that because that's who our God is. He's a prayer answering God. Look what it says in verse number nine. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be what? Saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever, there it is again, believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You say, well, you know what? I tried praying a prayer. I tried doing that call thing. I tried something, else, but it scares me to death. No, no, no. Whosoever believes on him is not going to be ashamed. Oh, hey, listen, you don't have to worry about what somebody thinks about you when you tell them about Jesus. Because it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about him. Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. But then verse 13, for whoso, oh, verse 12, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Timothy was sure glad about that, wasn't he? For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that what? Call upon him. You got to call on him. You're going to have to make the request and you're going to have to determine where you're going. Because you see, because we're all under sin, because we all deserve hell, because we all deserve to die and be separated from God, we have to call unto him. And we're not all going to heaven. Do you understand? Regardless of what they tell you on television, we're not all going to but only the whosoever's who call on the name of the Lord. I, I was having my hair cut down in Ashland there, and the barber, he got his razor on the back of my neck, and he said, we're all going the same place. We're all just getting there a different way. I waited until he got my razor, his razor <laughs> off my neck. I said, sir, I've been all over this country. I've been everywhere, but I've been all over this country. And I'm just telling you. There's a lot of ways to get to certain places. But the Bible says there's only one way to get to Jesus. You're going to have to, to get to God, you're going to have to come through the only way. He's the only door. He's it. Jesus is it. There is no other way. And you and I are sinners. We're going to have to make that request. We're going to have to call. But I want you to notice a rescue. Look at the end of the verse. Whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Saved. What a rescue. John Stott said this. He said, Christianity is in its very essence a rescue religion. Oh, I don't like the idea of religion, but the point is that Christianity is all about a rescue from our sin. You may remember that Daniel was in the lion's den and needed a rescue. God was able. You may remember that Rahab was in a city that was condemned, Jericho. And she needed a rescue. And she put down a scarlet cord over the wall. And not only she, but all of her family. Amazing. As you look at the scripture and you see that, 
And you'll see that that's what it says. In fact, would you go back with me, please, to Joshua and, and just notice for a moment this incredible story as we see it early on. Joshua. And you'll see in chapter number two. It's beautiful because we see that the hearts of the people did melt. And, and it says in verse 12, she says, Now therefore I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father and mother and my brethren, my sisters and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men who were the spies answered her and said, Our life is for yours. If ye utter not this our business. And he goes, on to talk about that very incredible thing. And over in chapter 6, if you'll notice, it says that there's a conquest of Jericho and they come and they surround the wall. And you remember, they go around the wall. How many times? Well, yeah. Once, uh, they go around 13 times, don't they? Once every day and then seven times on the seventh day and then the priest lift the trumpet. And they blow the horns and they shout and the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. But it's interesting, isn't it? When you notice what it says over in uh, verse number 22. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath. And notice it says here, as he swore unto her, verse 23, and the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she she had and they brought out all her kindred and left them outside the camp of Israel without the camp of Israel and they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein only the silver the gold the vessels of brass and iron they put in the treasury of the house of the Lord verse 25 read the first four words and Joshua saved Rahab. You say, what's so great about that? I'm just going to tell you that the name Joshua is the same name that our Savior is going to bear as he comes in the New Testament. Yahashua. He's going to come as the Yeshua. He's going to come as the Joshua of the New Testament. And when you see it in the Old Testament, you're going to notice that Joshua saved Rahab. If you think of it in the vernacular today, it's the same as saying Jesus saved Rahab. You understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying is it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what you've been. Jesus is in the business of saving and he can save you today. So the question is, are you saved? He saved a demoniac in Mark chapter number five. He saved Jonah out of the whale's belly. He can certainly take care of you. But you say save, save from what? Ah, save from hopelessness. Yesterday at the Ashland County Memorial Cemetery, I read the scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It tells us that we're to sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Why do they have no hope? Why is there a world that has no hope? They walk around and don't understand what life is all about. Ephesians chapter 2 makes it clear they're without God in this world. Hopelessness. Save from hopelessness. You say, man, I feel so hopeless. I don't know exactly what to do. Suicides are on the rise. You say, what's going on? People have hopelessness. You can be saved from hopelessness today through Jesus Christ. You can be saved from hatred today. They call this the age of rage. Isn't it weird what's going on in our culture? With all of the wickedness and the fighting and the turmoil and the demonstrations and all that kind of stuff. Save from hatred. Save from habits. You say, man, I've been trying, I've been trying. Hey, listen, if you want to get good, you've got to get God. That's what you've got to get. You'll never get good on your own until you know God. How can you know God? By trusting Jesus as your Savior. That's the only way. You can change churches. You can change your denomination. You can change locations. You can change your baby's diapers. You can change anything you want to change. But I'm telling you, you can't change you. Only Christ can change you. You see, you don't need a confirmation. 
You don't need a new confirmation. You don't need a new creed. You don't need new rules. You don't need some kind of communion. You don't need baptism. What you need is Jesus. You say, well, wait a minute. What are all those other things? Aren't they good things? Yeah, but they'll never save you. You have to call unto him for the rescue. And you can be saved from hopelessness. You can be saved from hatred. But I'll tell you what. You can be saved from hell. You say, that's kind of a word I don't like to talk about. Well, the Bible talks about it. Jesus talked about it. In Luke chapter number 16, Jesus talked about a man who was a rich man and he went to hell. He talks about real people with real torment and real pain in a real place. And it astounds me when I think of the number of people who will not accept the rope of rescue instead to stiff arm the rescue offered by God himself through his son Jesus Christ who died for your sins and mine on the cross of Calvary. You can be saved. I was reading a story about the greatest rescue in Coast Guard history. You may have seen it in a movie that Hollywood put out in 2016 called The Finest Hour. Fascinating. Up near Boston, in a little town, an event occurred on a on a day in the winter when these ships, big ships, had come up from, uh, from way down south, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and there were two of them. And fascinating, one was called the Pendleton, the other one was called the Mercer. And these two ships found themselves in such a, a nor'eastern storm up on the east coast that literally both ships broke in half. Now, they said that these ships were made out of what they called dirty metal. It had too much sulfur in them, and when they welded them, they didn't weld them well. And actually, these ships broke in half the stern and the bow. So a lot of the crew had gone after what had, they had found was the Mercer, and the, a lot of the Coast Guard crew had gone after that. They didn't realize there was another ship called the Pendleton that had also broken, that had come up, and it's out in the sea. And so... The man who was in charge of the Coast Guard asked one of the men who was, who was there, an, an, an incredible man whose, uh, whose uh, name, uh, oh, uh, let, me, let me get it there, Bernie Weber. Bernie Weber. Uh, they asked him, they said, would you be willing to do this mission? There's people on that boat and they've got to be rescued. But he knew that in order to do this mission, it would be almost certain death. So Bernie asked, who was the son of a Baptist preacher, some other guys who were still there, some were ducking the process, and he said, would you be willing to go? Would you be willing to go? Would you be willing to go? Andy Fitzgerald, Richard Livesey, and Aaron Maskey stepped up and said, we'll do it. It had gotten dark. They were going to get in a boat that's... Not very long at all. It's simply a very small boat, a 36-footer. And, and they're going to, with four crew members, try to go out and find a way to help this ship that's broken in half. As they go out across the sandbar, the waves are coming in. The boat goes sideways. A wave comes over, crashes into the boat, breaks out the compass. They have no compass now. They still have a light. But they hear out in the water the cracking and the creaking of this metal from these ships that have broken apart. And so they head that direction through the storm. The waves are way bigger than the boat itself. This boat is designed to self-right itself. Many times it goes sideways and comes back up and these guys somehow hang on in the midst of this. The water is icy, it's frozen, it's incredible, it's an incredible storm. Somehow, by the grace of God, they get to this ship. 
And they get there, they pull up next to it. I don't know if you can see it over here on the bow, but there's a little ladder, a rope ladder that comes down right on the, right on the front section here. And that little rope ladder, they're going to pull up as best they can with these storm and waves and all of that. And they're going to try to get these guys who are coming down this rope ladder. There's 37 of them on this portion of the ship. The boat that they're on, excuse me, there's 33 of them. The boat that they're on only holds 12 guys besides the crew. But they're going to take these guys as they come in and the waves barge in and they pull up next to the ship and these guys are going to come down that little rope ladder and as they come in, they're going to jump off onto the boat in the midst of this storm. Terrible disaster. One after another, they come down. 32 of them get into a boat that holds 12. The last guy, his name is George. They call him Tiny. He weighs 300 pounds. He's the cook. Comes down the ladder. He had given everybody else, he said, you go first, you go first, you go first. He comes down. Just as he gets ready to jump, a wave comes in, moves the rescue boat away. He falls into the water and the boat slams up against the ship and crushes it. This is going to be something that Bernie Weber is going to face for years to come. How they could catch these other men and lose that one very important man. Isn't that the way our Savior is? He's concerned not just about all the others, but the one lost sheep. He cares about you. Somehow they get these guys into this boat. And now the radio is saying, go help the other section. Go that way. And Bernie Weber turns it off and heads toward shore. He has no options but to try to get home. And that's not going to be easy either. He finally gets it to shore. The people in the town on the Cape there have all lined on the shore hearing the story of what has happened about these four guys. They don't know if they'll ever even see them again. But these guys come back. There's 36 people on that boat. How they get there. You say, that's incredible. Yeah, it's incredible, all right. But as I read the story and as I read it over and over from different viewpoints, I found it completely fascinating. And on the very last line in one of the articles that I read, it said, yes, these four men made heroic efforts, including Bernie Weber, who was the captain, Richard Livesey, Andy Fitzgerald, and Irvin Maskey, and they were awarded the Coast Guard's gold life-saving medal. But Weber credits the Lord as having a hand on the tiller during the rescue. You say, how could they do it without the Lord? I don't think they could. But I got good news for you. No matter how desperate you are, God was willing to send his son to rescue you. And he came down for you and you alone to rescue you and I from hopelessness and hatred and hell and that we could have eternal life in heaven because that's who our God is. He's a rescuer. So you don't have to have hopelessness when you die. In Princeton, New Jersey, last summer we were there at the graveyard of Jonathan Edwards. Aaron Burr, Grover Cleveland, they're all buried there. But there's another tombstone that's also there, William Hahn. He died in 1980. The reason he's remembered is for his epitaph. It simply says, quote, I told you I was sick. <laughs> As I read that, I thought, isn't that crazy? I told you I was sick. And he died. You say, what does it have to do with anything? It has this. Until you come to a point where you realize that we're sick and we're sinful and there's no hope for us, that's when you're going to 
to understand the far-reaching hand of God who comes to any whosoever that's here today. And if you'll request and call upon the name of the Lord, you can be rescued from your sin today. You say, preacher, it seems like you're going around the barn for a little verse like that. No, because God delights in saving souls. And I know that there's nothing that delights him more. And if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your savior and you don't know for sure and it scares you to think about hell and you're concerned and you say, I'm ashamed of Jesus. Maybe you need the rescuing tug of Christ who alone can save you. Father, would you please do that work in our hearts? Would you please let us realize that we're all in a condition of sinfulness, that we're all sick and we all need help. So God, please, for that one who's here today who doesn't know Jesus as a personal savior, would you save him today? How many of you would say, preacher, there was a time in my life when I knew I was a sinner I realized it in such a strong way. The Holy Spirit of God convicted me of my sin. I realized I needed a savior and I trusted Jesus. I've been rescued by his grace. I know that for sure. That's my testimony. I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. That's my testimony. Would you slip your hand up all over this room? I'm a believer in Christ. I know that the Lord is my savior. I'm thankful to God. He's the one who did the saving. God bless you. Put him down. Thank you for your honesty. For whatever reason, I noticed a few that did not raise your hand. Would it be today that you need Jesus as your Savior? He can rescue you. We can show you from a Bible how you can know for sure that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came down to this earth to die on a cruel cross to shed his blood. Why? Because your blood would never work. You and I are sinners, but he was the sinless son of God. And his sacrifice on the cross paid for your sins. You had to have his sacrifice. And you need it today. You say, preacher, I'm not saved. I've never been rescued by Jesus Christ. I need Christ today. Would you pray for me? Slip your hand up anywhere in this room today. I need Jesus. I'm not sure, but I'd like to be sure. God bless you. Would there be someone else? I want to settle that today. I want to make my peace with God. The God who's the peacemaker, I want to take care of that today. Listen, you can know that today. You don't have to be worried. You don't have to be afraid. You can know it. The Bible says these things are written. The word of God is written that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know that today. And you can trust Christ. I'm going to give you an opportunity We'd love to share with you from a Bible how you can know for sure you're on your way to heaven. We're going to sing a song in just a moment. I'm going to ask if you really would like to trust Christ as your Savior. Just come and shake my hand at the front. I'll have someone show you from a Bible how you can know for sure you're on your way to heaven. You'll never have to question it again. You'll never have to worry about hell. You'll never have to worry about the future. You'll never have to worry because Jesus will be your Savior in heaven. That's what the Bible says. I'm telling you the truth as best as I can. Father, thank you for what you're going to do. There's some people in this room, Lord. God, you've given us an opportunity. Some of us in this room have been rescued, but we know people that need rescue. We've got sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters and friends and co-workers and neighbors, and they need rescue. Now, Lord, certainly we can tell them that the reach of your love comes all the way to them. And all they have to do is pour out their request and call in the name of the Lord to be rescued by you. Lord, please help us. Please help us. There may be some in this room today and they say, listen, I know I've got friends, relatives. They need the rescue attack of Christ himself. Listen, would you be the one to tell them? Would you be the one to let them know? Father, we're going to thank you for what you do because you're in charge of it all.